Good morning, I'm Tim Alexander, Director of Worship here on the Hill. We're so glad that you're with us today online. Take just a moment and comment below. Tell us who you are and where you're watching from. We'd love to be able to connect with you. Today, we continue in our series titled Different. Jeff is speaking today about a different kind of holiness. As we begin in worship today, let's take just a moment. So let's settle, take a deep breath, and let's ask this question. Lord God, what are you wanting me to take away from this service today? Let's pray. Father, please be real to us today. Open our eyes that we can see your message for us right here, right now. Amen. Let's worship together. There's a table that you prepared for me In the presence of my enemies It's your body and your blood you shed for me This is how I fight my battle And I This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. This is how I. This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. This is how. I
So I'd like for us to read 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19 together. It says this, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So don't put your hope in wealth. Why? Because it's uncertain. Have you felt uncertain in these uncertain times? I mean, how many of you know that we don't serve an uncertain God? Put your hope in God who richly provides us with everything we need. Do good, be rich in good deeds, be generous and be willing to share. And then what? You're taking hold of the true life. So as we prepare to give, let's ask ourselves, where's our hope? Make sure it's in God who is our everlasting faithful provider. Let's pray. Father in heaven, today may we honor you in our giving and may we generously give because our true hope is in you. You've promised to provide for us and may we, through our giving, provide for others. Amen. Do you ever feel like you don't quite fit in with the people around you? Like, do your values and lifestyle seem to be a little different from the people at work or maybe your neighbors or perhaps even your own family? Maybe it occurred when you first stepped into a different culture and the people had a different language. Or it could have emerged in a discussion with people and maybe you said something that might have been perceived as odd or even culturally inappropriate. And as a result, you simply felt different. When was the time you felt out of place or different? Comment below and let us know. Now, I remember a time in my own life when I was beginning to take Christ seriously, and I was probably an early college student. And so I wanted to read my Bible, so I started carrying my Bible around with me. <laughs> I got a lot of looks on campus. I mean, I even had friends who started calling me Rev long before I was ever a rev. And then I started praying before meals. I mean, you know, I wasn't trying to be weird, but I was attempting to live my life in a way that I thought Jesus might. And so I wanted to be, well, different, but I didn't want to be weird. I, just, I wanted to be holy. And I wanted to live by a different set of values. And I didn't really want to stand out, but you know, when you begin to follow Jesus and you start taking Him and His teachings and His challenges and you start following him more seriously, well, then guess what happens? Mm, you stand out. Yeah, and you start acting and operating in ways that are, well, well, they're going to be perceived as, you guessed it, different. Today, we're in part two of a message series in the New Testament letter of 1 Peter. Now, if you missed last week, we learned that Peter was writing to a group of people that were being severely persecuted, living somewhere between 60 to 65 AD in the middle of the first century. Nero was the emperor. He was persecuting the Christians, and it was really tough. And Peter is trying to write to them to give them hope. And he's basically saying, this world is not your home. In other words, it's this, you're just passing through. And as a result, Peter said, God is calling you, me, them, us, to be different. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you're called 
to be different because you're going to have different values and you're going to have different passions and you're going to have a different use of your time and a different use of your resources and you're going to become a different parent. And as a result, you'll also become a different spouse and a different employee and a different neighbor. Don't miss, my friends, the central idea that if we're going to be serious about following the resurrected Jesus, then God will call us to be different. And for our purposes this morning, the key difference comes in a word that we've all heard, but we're not sure we want to have anything to do with. And what's this word you ask? Well, thanks for asking. It's this, holiness. Now, the minute I say that word, for many people, the idea of holiness smacks of religion and it's an instant turnoff. And it feels like an old Catholic nun, right, with a ruler in her hands poised to crack someone's knuckles as if they look so much like they're having fun. Or... We think holiness is just good behavior on steroids. Like holiness equals make religious. No, no. Instead, holiness is a desire to simply be more like Christ. See, often our attitude about holiness is kind of like the attitude that our children or grandchildren have when they're made to eat broccoli, Brussels sprouts, and boiled cabbage. They fuss and they complain and they say, oh, do I have to? which leads me to the central idea of learning how to be different as it relates to holiness. Holiness doesn't come from a have to, but a want to. For Peter, being different, or for our purposes, being holy, or becoming like Christ, well, it involves a dedication to two words. These two words run through both testaments. Here they are, love and, we already said it, holiness. In fact, God can really be described with both of these words. And if you had to boil down the character and nature of Almighty God with just two words, I think this is it. God equals holy love. Now, pastors and Bible teachers describe holiness as being set apart, which is good, and believe it or not, it's, it's grammatically correct. Holiness is a Greek word, hagios, which does mean set apart. But even that really misses the point. You see, when set apart becomes the definition, it feels like a group of people who've sort of withdrawn from the world and now they're living their life in spiritual quarantine because they don't want to catch the sin virus. And you think about this, believe it or not, this has happened all throughout Christian history. Groups that don't like the culture or don't like the society, and what do they do? They pull away and they try to hold on to a way of life. Now, if that's the way that we define holiness, then we end up avoiding the type of people who we believe are infected with the sin virus. So then what we do is we look at all those people, whoever those people are, and we deem that their behavior is less than what God would want. And so we decide not to be infected with their sin virus. So the best thing that we can do is what? Stay away. Now, when this becomes our definition of a holiness, here's the crazy thing. No one wants to go near it. And truthfully, it actually keeps people away. And it keeps the very ones away who need it, and they never experience it. And we end up thinking that we, the quarantined, are spiritually healthy when the truth is we're infected with the very same virus, which now has manifested itself in our sense of spiritual superiority, and we develop a holier-than-thou internal attitude. So the biggest obstacle for so many people to be faithful to God's call to be different or holy, is this longing to look like everyone else. See, the reality is we just want to fit in. 
Do you remember when you were in middle school, you were a middle school student, and all you ever wanted to do was look like everyone else? I mean, you wanted to be your own person, of course, but you wanted to wear the cool clothes and the cool shoes and do all the same cool things that everybody else was doing. And the last thing that you ever really wanted to do was to stand out. But God, on the other hand, has a different plan. God says, no, I, I kind of need you to stand out. I don't want you to blend in. I need you to be different. Not, not, not in a weird way. The world might think you're weird, but don't worry about them. Focus on me. Don't worry about normal. Because have you ever looked around? Have you ever looked around to see what is normal? Well, normal's broke. Normal is bondage, and normal is fear, and normal is divorce, and normal is tension, and normal is sleepless nights, and normal is anxiety, and normal is not liking the job that you're in and fighting depression. And, and if that's what normal is, oof, i got to be honest, gang, I don't want anything to do with normal. In fact, I kind of want off the normal road. Jesus said there is a normal road. He said that it's a path that's broad and wide, many people are on it, but he said there's a different road. And this one is much narrower and the gate is smaller. And he said, only a few people on this road, for broad is the road and wide is the path that leads toward destruction. But narrow is the one that leads to life and only a few people find it. Here's what I'm praying for. I'm praying that we would be among the few because of the passion of those few, there would be more and more and more and more and more that would find the path that leads to life. No, it's not normal. It's holy. Peter said it this way. So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You, don't, you didn't know any better then. But now... You must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. If you want to learn a new skill, you know what you have to do? you got to practice because it doesn't happen automatically. I mean, learning a new skill, practicing lessons or scales in music or whatever it is, or maybe it's a training program. And so you got to run so many miles a day or do so many push-ups or sit-ups or whatever. And the reality is the instructor... Well, they're going to know whether or not you've been practicing. I love what John Eldridge says. He says this, We exercise because we want to grow stronger. We take vitamins in the hope of being healthy. We attend language classes expecting to learn a new language. We travel for adventure and we work in the hope of prospering. We love partly in the hope of being loved. So why Christianity? What is the effect Christianity is intended to have upon a person who becomes a Christian? And then he says this, The way you answer that question is mighty important. Your beliefs about this will shape the convictions, your convictions, about nearly everything else. It will shape your understanding of the purpose of the gospel. It will shape your understanding of what you think God is up to in a person's life. The way you answer this one question will shape your thoughts about church and community, service and justice, prayer and and worship, it is currently shaping the way you interpret your experiences and your beliefs about your relationship with God. What's the question you ask? Simply this, what is Christianity supposed to do to a person? The simplest and shortest answer I can give you is make you like Jesus. Now listen, no one accidentally stumbles their way into holiness and godly character. So what does it look like to practice and to start living like Jesus and reflecting His character? Well, let's go back to the idea of those who quarantine from the sin virus I mentioned a moment ago. If you think of Jesus, He never really sequestered Himself away from the world. He wasn't afraid to get the sin virus. Instead, you know what He did? He jumped in feet first. Jesus had an incredible way of not beating people up with their sin issues. So what does He do? He offers abundant grace and spoke challenging truth so that others will be drawn into his style of holiness, which was easy and relaxed, not demanding, but something that people clamored to be around. I mean, Jesus just oozed love and holiness. And you know what? People flocked to it. Question, do people flock to you? Yeah, me neither. (laughs) We've got some work to do, right?
So Peter's audience is experiencing suffering in some form or another, and he's urging them, hang on to those practices, the practices of faith. He's saying that money and possessions and popularity and fitting in, that's not going to last, but faith in Jesus will. And if Jesus is really raised from the dead and he's truly victorious over sin and death and all the garbage of this world, then by his resurrection power, the Holy Spirit living in you, then you will have lasting power like nothing else. And you know, you know what? Guess what? People will be drawn to that style of holiness. I know what you're thinking. It's like your kids and your grandkids. Oh, do I have to? Holiness doesn't come from a have to but a want to. You don't have to be holy. You get to be holy. I'm caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet Caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't owe me anything Just want you. Well, I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sang another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart. I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda. I'm sorry when I forgot that you're enough. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm caught up in your prayer. And I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessing Nothing else will
So I'm in my final year of seminary preparing for the ministry, and I attended Asbury Theological Seminary. I'm there, I'm in the opening chapel of this last couple of semesters. And the president of the seminary always spoke on the opening day, and I remember him uh, standing up, and I don't remember anything he said in his sermon (laughs) that day except this one line. He said, you are as holy as you want to be. And I was instantly cut to the quick. What was preventing me from being holy? Because holiness isn't something that you do necessarily. In fact, the truth of the matter is you do nothing but yield to the work of the Holy Spirit. You see, that's all you do. You yield. You surrender your rights and your preferences and your privileges to God, and then you give God the reins of your life. So what prevents us from being holy is us. In chapter 1 of 1 Peter, he says these words, You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth, so now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all your heart. This passage challenges me to use a different measuring stick when evaluating my life, which brings me to the second word. Remember, we talked about love and holiness, and it's love. Love is a different measuring stick. So the question is, am I becoming more loving? Am I loving God and my neighbor more deeply from my heart? See, if if Peter were here to counsel me, I think he'd be unimpressed to hear about how many Bible studies that I've done or all the Christian busyness that I've layered upon my life when the central question is, does my pursuit of holiness, being like Jesus, cause me to love others better and more deeply? Because if I'm still rude and crude and a jerk and basically looking like and acting like the world and all of my life choices, then I've probably got some work to do. So let me say this to all the parents out there. You can't expect to raise children who are different from the world if we are not. Oh, do I have to? Holiness is not like Brussels sprouts. It doesn't come from a have to, but a want to. Remember our question, what is Christianity supposed to do to a person? The answer is make them like Jesus. So our study of scripture, prayer, fasting, worship should drive us out of our houses and into relationship and service of those who need it most. Who needs it most? Our neighbors. So if we're going to be good neighbors, let's stop quarantining from the sin virus and start becoming more like Jesus and move out into the world and one life at a time, one neighborhood at a time. Let's infect the world with an overdose of scriptural holiness and love. J.D. Walt, who was our study leader through our most recent Lenten series, says these words. What if holiness is not what we thought? What if holiness means blind eyes open and deaf ears hearing and lame people leaping and mute tongues singing? What if holiness means water springing up in the desert and pools of refreshment in the place of arid sand? And if so, this means holiness is actually a relief. It's a reversal of broken conditions and situations, and this, my friends, means that holiness is ultimately love. And the way of holiness looks like a viral movement of concentrated love, and what Peter is giving the church is a different vision of what it looks like to be the people of God, and challenging us to live and act and speak and walk a different style of holiness. Do you remember, some of you are old enough to remember the old bumper sticker, God is my co-pilot? Well, if God is your co-pilot, could I politely suggest that you swap seats? If living a holy life is no more enjoyable than eating broccoli or Brussels sprouts or boiled cabbage, then we may have gotten it 
all wrong. Remember, holiness doesn't come from a have to, but a want to. You don't have to be holy, my good friend. You get to be holy. As we wrap up this week, remember that we're online on Wednesday, so come on and join us. If you have prayer requests, we really take those seriously, so comment below and let us know how we can be praying for you. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.